Hey everyone, welcome back to the Let's Talk podcast with me and David, and today we are going to be talking about Jaws and Jaws 2 and everything in between. So we're going to be really just talking all things Jaws. And uh, David, I believe that's your favorite film, right? Yes, it is. It's my favorite film of all time. Ever since the first time I've seen it, when I was around six years of age. So that's a long time. No, I haven't seen a better movie. So I've seen plenty of great movies, but every time I visit Jaws, I just enjoy it like I did the first time I've ever seen it. Would you say you probably watch this one every single year of your life since you've seen it? No. Not every year since I've seen it, when I was around six, when it was on television, and nobody really had VCRs or VHSs. Uh. So when it was on TV, it was like an event. You know, we only had like four channels. All your friends in the street here was on. And when you were in the school, all your friends were talking about it. Set up Magic. I remember the parents would let me set up me at the because I was so excited to see it. Then when you go in the school the next day, you're talking to your friends about playing Jaws and when I got through the playground. <laughs> you go and find a piano and play the theme on it. I remember doing that in school. <laughs> <laughs> well, but with, yeah, we did have a music hall and sometimes there would be a piano there and maybe you'd do a few notes on it. Yeah. it. So it wasn't until it was the early 90s before I actually got it on VHS. I recorded it off the television. So I would say, I think what he is, what he is his idea. 12 maybe, 13. So uh, yes, I've at least seen it once a year since it was 12 or 13. Uh, and back then, it was like almost every every week. But now that I'm older, I don't have as much time, and I can basically act a part of the movie. I can recite the movie to you. Um, <laughs> I make a point of watching it once a year, and I like to watch it around uh, summer time. Um, I, have, I haven't actually watched it this year yet, but um, the weather's been horrible here the last few weeks, so I haven't felt like watching it. Yeah, you got to pick a nice, hot, sunny day to watch Jaws. Where I live, like in America, the movie takes place like over Independence Day, so it's always become like a 4th of July thing here. And that's usually when I try and watch it. Like, I don't love Jaws as much as you. I wouldn't even put this in my top 10 Spielberg, to be honest with you, which I know is crazy, but I'm just not a big Jaws guy. I will try, though. I've told you before we started recording, I try it, like, probably at least once a year just to try, because I really feel like I'm missing out, because people love Jaws. That's not even just you. Like, Matt, that was one of his top three favorite movies. My other cousin, Dennis, that's his favorite film of all time. So I always feel left out, <laughs> like not loving it as much as everybody else. When I was a kid, growing up, all my, all my friends enjoyed the movie as, as, as kids. But when I became a teenager, uh, and that was around like, the early 90s and things like that, there wasn't as many people or my friends that actually were ups- as upset with it as I was. That was around the time movies like Goodfellas and Pulp Fiction were coming out, and, and that's what they were basically watching, even at 13, 14. 15 years of age and that's what that's what they were into movie ways friends have said you know respected it and said it was a really good movie but not to the heights that i've been obsessing over it and it's really funny john as well because it wasn't like i knew back then that this movie was the first summer blockbuster i didn't know back then that this movie changed movies i knew very little about steven spielberg i knew that he was one of the best directors in hollywood and he directed indiana jones and around this time the early 90s like jurassic park it just came out and at that particular time I visited Universal Studios in Florida. Oh really? And I yeah, I seen how movies were made and I think that's what really started my passion with, with movies, uh, how they were made. Jaws was the forefront for me. I wanted to know everything about how this movie was made. I wanted to know about the actors in it. I wanted to know about the mechanical shark. I if I seen because the shark was so conceived during the movie, trying to find a picture of that shark was very, very difficult. This was before the internet. So if you could get a Spielberg book and there was a picture of the mechanical shark, I mean, it blew my mind seeing this massive 25 foot practical mechanical marvel that turned out they never worked anyway. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's kind of what made this movie work so well is basically not working it's crazy actually i mean obviously we'll dive into the behind the scenes stuff because that stuff has always been what fascinates me most about jaws in general yeah. because as much as i don't love jaws i appreciate jaws yeah. so much because it's so well made uh it's yeah. one of the best horror films ever and steven spielberg like this really is what made him steven spielberg he did movies before this i think duel was like 1972 i think you know like that's yeah. kind of like uh where people he got that started with suspense because that's just basically just a real straightforward thriller nothing really more to it but then he did this and then like you said this is what made the blockbuster mold release everything day and date because this is one year after godfather part two which I think is yes. the highest grossing film of 1974. And these are just night and day 
very different movies. Yeah, well, I think that when I started actually researching um, Spielberg, I remember buying, like, uh, buying Spielberg books when I had the money or getting them out of the library and just reading the Jaws parts. <laughs> <laughs> Only the Jaws parts. <laughs> look, at, look at up the index in the back, right? Where's, where's the Jaws parts? 1973, 73, 75, part of 76 because of the success of the movie and stuff like that. And you're right, yes, he started off with uh, with Jewel, which was actually a television movie. Mm -hmm. And they actually released it theatrically um, in Europe because it was that well made. Really? It's such a great movie. It's yeah, actually coming uh, to 4K on September 5th. I'm going to grab it because I, I love Duel, actually. It's brilliant. I actually have it in, in Steel Book here uh, on DVD. I've had it for many years and I haven't watched it so long. And I've actually been saying to my daughter, wonder would she like to watch it with me? Uh, we're trying to explain that here. It's about a truck that's chasing after someone through the desert. It's like, it's certainly insane. But... It doesn't sound like it would be interesting. The plot is, that's it. That's the whole movie, but it works. <laughs> that's basically it. Yeah. Um, when, when Spielberg got the, the galleys of the book, uh, before the book was even released for Jaws, he read it and he says, oh, this is like a version of Jewel, only it's a shark, and that's what intrigued him about Megan Jaws. Yeah, well, that would I I can I don't blame him for that because that was the right decision to make, and I guess this is produced by uh, Universal Studios, right? He pretty much yes. he's pretty much worked with them ever since, but this put him on the map with them because Duel, like you said, straight to TV, that was a TV film, and then yes. this movie, I guess, his career really was make or break with this. I've always been a Spielberg fan since I was a small kid watching his movies like uh, Portuguese, E.T., Indiana Jones, movies like that. So I've been fascinated with his career. I've always been a fan. And the more, and I, I like looking back more to those early years, those years which he actually, um, formative years, the Valvin years. And it turns out that um, he basically bluffed his way on through Universal Backlot. He was signed up by Ed Sandberg. I can't remember the exact contract, but he was originally directing television. Like, for example, he directed the first ever episode of Columbo. Really? Yeah. I actually the didn't know that. Series. Now, there was a few yeah, there was a few pilots before that, but he directed the first of the, the actual season. Of the season. Um, and it's actually very, very good. And then from that, he directed a few other television programs, and then he moved on to Jewel. And the first actual official movie that he actually directed was The Sugarland Express. Have you ever heard of that movie? I have, but that's actually one Spielberg movie I haven't seen is the Sugarland Express. Or if I have seen it, it's a very long time. I put that like with remember the movie Always. I, I know I've seen it, but I can't yeah. remember it. <laughs> well, you know what? I haven't actually seen Always, but I would recommend the Sugarland Express. It's a very, very good movie. I watched it again recently. Goldie Hawn stars in it. Oh, I love and, Goldie Hawn. Um, <laughs> oh, she's brilliant, and she, she's very good, and she's young little. Um, and her boyfriend in it is, I don't can't remember his name, his name, William Atherton, who played, uh, you know the guy in Ghostbusters who um, comes and shuts the containment unit down with a ginger beard? Yeah, he's also in Die Hard. He's the uh, news anchor. He's a dick. <laughs> he's a dick, that's right. He always plays a dick. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, he's actually in the Superman Express. Uh, and, and, he, and I didn't even make the connection with the years later. I was like, that's a young William McAdamon from Ghostbusters. But the reason I'm saying about Sugarland as well is that the producers of Sugarland were the producers on Jaws. Oh, okay. And that was the first movie that he worked with John Williams. Oh, okay. So, jo wow. Okay. So, wow. The relationships really got started on Sugarland and that came to jo Okay. All right. I didn't yes. know all that. Yeah. And the funny thing was, was that when Zanuck, Richard Bison and David Brown, the producers of Jaws, they bought the rights to the book. When they bought it, I think it was from Bantam Books, they had an arrangement where you had to use one of the directors from their um, union or guild or something like that, who was a part of the scene guild as theirs. And they agreed to that. And there was a guy, there was a guy called Dick Richards, and they had an interview with him, and he kept calling the shark a wheel in the interview. And Peter Bansley was there, and Peter Bansley says, I'm not going to have a guy who thinks a shark is a wheel directing this movie. So they had to say, look, we're going to have to let this guy go. And they had Spielberg and Main. They had Spielberg and Main from the start. So um, Spielberg then, you know, they gave him the galleys, and he read them, and he, he wanted to make it. So that's basically what the relationship started with John and um, the producers, and that's what got him the job on Jaws. And he was already working at Universal at that point with him. That's actually correct. Okay. I didn't know any of that. I knew. I just figured that he got the job, of just like a director for hire kind of thing. I didn't realize he even had that much connection to it before the movie actually even came out. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, well, I think he was saying that like uh, a 
so many pictures being with the studio as a lot of directors were in them days. But the whole talk was was that he, he was very young at the time, John. I mean, this is 1973. So he was only 24 years of age, around 24, maybe 25 years of age. But the talk around Hollywood in the studio was, was that he was this young kind of um, wonderkin. You know, he was coming through and he was going to be this amazing director. And he made Jewel, which had got a lot of um, praise and critical reception. And then he had made Sugarland. And, and again, that was, but it wasn't a commercial hit. So we really needed a hit. And it was Sidney Sheinberg from the studio that was really push, pushing as well to make it. Because it, it became a stage where there was a lot of problems with the production, uh, a lot of script problems, a lot of script doctoring, a lot of different people writing script. Um, and then there was a lot of problems with Mechanical Shark, how they were going to do this. Mm. And he got cold feet. And at one stage, he was going to back out. Um, and and uh, they had to talk him into doing it. That's, yeah, I mean, the behind-the-scenes stuff, that's the stuff, like, on-set problems, like, actually filming on water is something that they don't... He always tries to direct people not to do that. Like, when they made Waterworld, I remember he... Uh, Kevin Costner said that Steven Spielberg called him and said, uh, make sure you don't film on real water, like, you know, film in a soundstage. <laughs> because they actually filmed yeah. this movie in Martha's Vineyard. That's <laughs> and, right. And they just... On the real water, and that you can't control that environment. It's an uncontrollable environment. And they thought that they could do that, and that's just one of those lessons yeah. you have to learn on the job. And that's the same thing, like with Bruce the shark. <laughs> you know, like yeah. you think it's going to go well, but when it doesn't, it's really your ability to adapt. And I think that's what makes Steven Spielberg one of the greatest directors ever. Is that he just rolled with the punches. I think at that particular time, he was he was new, he was fresh, he was a bit green, very naive. Um, him and the screenwriter, um, he actually hired a guy called Carl Godley to help uh, write the script. He originally um, hired him as a, an actor. He's actually in the movie. He oh. plays the newspaper editor. Oh, okay. Um, the big guy with a moustache. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, well, he, he wrote, well, co-wrote the movie. Peter Banstey gets credit. Carl Godley gets credit. Um, and I believe that um, he was friends with Spielberg. I think they met through the same agent. And they always um, threw ideas at each other and said, we're going to write movies. I'll write the movies you direct them. So he brought Carl on board first as an actor and then just listen, I wanted to rewrite the script while we're on location. Because he knew it wasn't up to scratch. He knew it wasn't up to speed. Before they were on location, they actually drew movies that were filmed in water tanks before 1973, 1974. And they thought that all these movies look fake. They look phony. And they thought, we want to do this on the water. We want this to look as real as possible. The only way this is going to work is if it's real. And that's why they ended up going to the East Coast. Um, the production designer, he scouted. I think it was the East Coast of the United States he scouted because obviously the book is set in uh, New England. So yep. he looked up and he eventually found Mark's Vineyard. And the reason they chose Mark's Vineyard, as beautiful as it is, it was more to do with the depth of the water. Currently, you can go a couple of meds out to sea and the depth is still in 40 feet. And that was enough, enough depth to uh, sink the platform for the mechanical shark to sit on. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's why they picked Marcus Vineyard. It had never been filmed by a uh, movie company before. Oh, yeah, no. And it's crazy to think that because it's one of the most famous vineyards in the entire world. And I wonder if Jaws made them that, actually, though. Because uh, like, cause people know where Jaws was filmed. Yeah, it, it may be. Maybe um, I, I I even speak to people now, and even like because the internet has made the world so small now, you can make so many kind of like uh, friends online, or you know, um, people that have the same various as yeah, as I was saying earlier when I was growing up in the nineties as a teenager. There's very few people even I know now that love Jaws as much as me. But I can go online and I can join a, a Facebook group, a YouTube group, and and uh, speak to people of the same kind of interest as me. But even if you mention the people online, sometimes. You know, even Americans or whatever, you know the Jaws was still the Martha's Vineyard. Some of them are kind of like a stone. They didn't know that. They didn't ever question what it was, was um, filmed. So there's still people out there that don't really know that it was actually filmed on location, on the ocean. Every bit of that movie was filmed on the sea, um, apart from some of the underwater work. Yeah, which makes probably a little bit of sense, but, you know, most of it, yeah, filmed there on location. And actually, speaking of Jaws 2... They filmed only certain scenes on Martha's Vineyard, like mainly the scene with the uh, the car platform that's there, and they filmed that at a location again when the car in the second film yeah. gets on the, uh, I guess it's a Bronco, I think. It gets on the thing, yeah. and in the first yeah. movie, that's when they actually have the whole conversation, the mayor, you know, 
uh, Brody yes. and everything is on that platform while it's moving. And then the rest of the Jaws 2 is, I think, is filmed in Florida. And I, I recognize that right yeah. away because the sand i've been to florida you've been to florida but like up here in the northeast the sand is very different than the set the yep. sand in florida it's like a very white sand down there and you notice it right away yeah that's right and it's really funny in jaws too that they actually make a comment mm. of saying about how white the sand is yeah um, <laughs> Nan peterson who's the real guy says look at this sand it's big sugar and it's funny that they actually point it out yeah, I think they did that because they know that, like, because I'm telling you, I knew right away it wasn't filmed on the same location. When you look at it, you're like, yeah, yeah. that, that, because Northeast Sand just does not look like that. It looks like Florida Sand. It, like, <laughs> you have to point it out because people are going to know yeah. right away that you, because it doesn't look the same Jaws 2 compared to the first Jaws, just in each locations in no, general. It, it, it doesn't. And, um, you know, funny enough, going back again, because I've been living with these movies for years now, it's hard for me to kind of I try and remember. You know, I know an awful lot about the nine. When did I learn about that? And when did the penny drop? And, you know, I, in the 90s, I didn't really notice too much of a, uh, of a difference to do with that. But when the DVD of Jaws 2 came out, I think it was 2001, there was a documentary on there, and it's on the new Blu-ray and 4K that's came out. Yeah. And um, that's when they said about it being filmed in, in Florida. And then when they mentioned that, yes, you do then notice the big differences. Um, and that may change maybe the facts of the movies, although I do think both movies... I do think for a sequel that wasn't directed by Spielberg that it still feels like a continuation of the first movie, even though unless you're looking, I'm not going to say looking out for it because you did notice it, um, unless you really kind of, um, for example, the town beach in Jaws 1, it seems like a sh shorter distance from the sand dunes to the water. Yes. It's supposed to be the same beach in Jaws 2, yet it's a lot longer from the edge of the sand dunes to the, to the surf. And yep. you can clearly see that when he's in his, in his shark tower. Um, but it's supposed to be the same beach because it's got the portlets, it's got the bands down, you know, they've, they've recreated them for the sequel. It's supposed to be the same beach. But that something like that never stuck out to me until I started learning about the movie and realized that they filmed um, a lot of it in Florida rather than Marcus Henry. Yeah, they tried to turn the camera, like, the way they would shoot it now was, uh, I think they were trying to face the other way of the beach, so you also wouldn't miss, like, the lake on the other side and everything, right. so, and, like, you know, they wouldn't film it from, like, the back as much, that way it would kind of, like, draw your eyes, like, you didn't really see the same, this side of the beach in the first Jaws, so it's believable that it would be the same beach, but certain aspects you just can't unsee. Yeah, that's true, um, like I said, that doesn't really bother me about the location, I, I actually, I think the location of Florida is actually beautiful in its own way. It is. Um, Martha's Vineyard has a certain charm. Um, would I have liked it have been filmed in Martha's Vineyard again? Um, probably. No, it doesn't really bother me. You know, there, there's actually a tactical reason why they moved to Florida, uh, more away from Martha's Vineyard, because when they were making the first movie, Spielberg, uh, in the second half of the movie, he wanted the, 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 the guys in the boat and in the orchid to feed, and the audience to feed as if um, they were trapped out at the sea. You know, there was no help. It's just demons against the shark. And when it started getting a wee bit scurry out there, you couldn't turn any, you couldn't just sail back the land because there was no land. You couldn't see the land. But what actually happened was, was that it took them so long to set up the boat and the shark, set up the shot. The next thing is you would see sailboats coming in the background and they would have to wait for the sailboats to disappear before they could film. Oh and my. by the time the sailboats disappeared, all the surf and uh, or the wake or the waves that moved the boat out of position. Now it wasn't near the shark and the raising them moved and, and they had all these technical difficulties. So what actually happened was, was that the production designer of Jaws, uh, Joe Wilds, he would actually visit in Florida and, um, in the around 1976 or 77 and he thought to himself, if they ever make a Jaws 2, he was on the beach and he seen the horizon and there was no boats to be seen anywhere. No boats actually sailed out there. Well, that's what he did. He killed it. And he thought to himself, if they ever make Jaws 2, we should do all the water stuff down here and do all the land stuff in Martha's Vineyard. So that's basically why. And the kind of compromise, um, I think as well, is that when the production company came to Martha's Vineyard in 1974 to film Jaws, first of all, the welcome them with open arms. Because here's Hollywood coming. It was exciting. We were making a movie, paying a lot of money. They rent out a lot of rooms, giving them a lot of work. And it was only supposed to take what was it, 50 days to, to film the movie? Yeah, sure. And it bloomed up to 150 days. So they were there all summer, and they felt as if it was impacting their summer season. 
and they didn't want them there anymore. And there were some of the, the, the locals, the Martha's Vineyard, rallying to get rid of them. Um, <laughs> things like that. They, of course they, they For were. example, <laughs> yeah, the, when the, the, the dead tiger shark scene, like, that's a real dead tiger shark. Oh, really? I think that was, yeah, that's real. They flew that up in Florida. They nicknamed it Oscar. And they hunted from the back. I, it was there for days on end. And it started the act of smell. It started the rat smell. Well, they actually yeah. had to put the makeup on it to make it look fresh. <laughs> but because it started stinking the place up so much, one night, uh, outside the production office, somebody left a dead rat and shark out on the steps of the production office yeah. for the producers to be with. Well, you know what? I guess fair is fair if you're going to do that to my town. I mean, I get that. I'd get frustrated, too, I guess, with them all there, especially if, like, you're a local living there. It's already got a, it's plenty of tourists just because it's the summer season anyway. And that's your... Yeah. So I guess kind of uh, reality reflected uh, uh, the movie, in a sense. But, you know, Amity needs this summer dollars, yeah. and so does Martha's Vineyard. <laughs> yeah, and, and if you know, it's like Spielberg kind of puts that into the movie. Now, some of that's already in the book, but it was Peter Bassley was from that area. Um, and that's actually in the book about Martin Brody's an outsider, right? But yeah. Alan Brody is from that area. So Martin never, ever feels accepted into the community. He always feels like an outsider. And then when Cooper comes along in the book, he's the same. He's this kind of rich, very tall, blonde haired good-looking guy. At that particular time in the book, Brody's having marital problems. And then Hooper has an affair with, with Alan. And there's all this mellow drama going on about him being a fish out of water and that bit. And then you have the mafia subplot. Now, obviously, that romance aspect of the novel isn't in the, isn't in the movie. I mean, Richard Dreyfus isn't, isn't exactly the same type of character which is in the novel. But what they've done in the movie instead was they made Alan and Cody outsiders. They made demons come from New York. And they made the two of them feel like outsiders. There's a scene on the beach where the wee boy in the raft gets killed. Yeah. And you hear Alan asking one of the locals, when did I get to become an islander? And you hear her saying, never, Alan, never. I, I guess you're right. Wow, I, that makes perfect sense. So Speedboard, as you say, adopt him. Um, he just they did. put that into the actual movie. The fact, you know, not feeling welcome, feeling like a, you know, a fish out of water, again, to use that cliche, you know, uh, trying to fit in. So he, so he not only is Martin Brody having to deal with that, then he has to deal with this problem. And that's probably part of the reason why when he's pressured by the mother to keep the beaches open, you know, it's only a boat next to Martin. And that's why he, part of the reason probably why he doesn't, because he's got, you know, he's got this difficult job and um, he, he wants to maybe try and fit in with the rest of the town. Yeah, I, I feel like Martin Brody is actually that character arc, I think, even continues into the second film, which maybe explains what I think is like the biggest flaw with the second film is in the first film, you know, it takes a couple, you know, it does take a couple people to die before they finally change their minds about, hey, we got to close these beaches or we got to yes. at least send somebody out there. But that happens, like you said, about halfway through the first movie, and then it just becomes these three yes. characters on a boat, which I actually think is my favorite part of the first film is them bonding on the ship actually i really enjoy those yes. aspects of it might not be a big fan of the like you know the shark stuff itself maybe that's just because i don't love sharks in general i don't have like a fear of them or like i don't enjoy shark week or just like looking up sharks but those character moments i think is what makes jaws feel special to me where in the second jaws yeah. you lose all of that and then it just kind of the mm -hmm. town again turns on martin brody who i think should have a statue built in his honor for saving the town <laughs> but they he may, die. he may have one going on you know he, i hope so because i mean he did save them <laughs> twice now you know they end up firing him for basically trying yeah. to do what he did in the first film he does get a little bit more aggressive about it but can you blame him yeah yeah listen you know what I, this is one of my pad gets about jaws 2 the way i view it is is that the audience is looking at it from their point of view they're not looking at it from the other people in the town's point of view there was only a few years ago there in Egypt where there was shark attacks and they kept the beaches open because of money. Out, they knew there were sharks and there was a few people killed. And they just kept it open. They didn't close the beaches at all. Put up warning signs, put up on the water with sharks. They couldn't hide it. They couldn't, they couldn't uh, brush it under, under the carpet. No. You know, so that, that's life in a deep night. So the thing is, from, from my point of view in Jaws 2, is that we're watching the movie we, we as an audience, we know there's a shark. We've seen it attack the divers. We've seen the fin. We've seen it attack the water skier and, mm -hmm. and the boat. 
Yep. Right? And the driver. But who would also part from those dickens has seen a shark. And I know it's sounding like the mirror here. <laughs> so we're in. <laughs> but the point I'm making is, is that if the boat at the start was drifting off Amory, the speedboat exploded. It's not like the Alex Kittner attack where the where people are on the beach and actually see the shark come out of the water, raise out of the water. Okay, that's a good it's point. It's not like the remains are on the beach of the bit arm, which they tried to fool everybody by saying it was a boat accident. And you had Hooper come in and say, well, that's what their shark bites. I don't want to insult people and people's intelligences, but I just think that people are looking at it from the wrong angle. That's not just frustrating, maybe for the audience, but you're feeling the frustration in the Martin Brody has. And Martin, the second movie, in a lot of ways, I think Roy Shader, in a lot of ways, puts in a better performance than Jaws Freeman goes into our film. Well, I actually do agree with you on that because I feel like Roy Scheider had to do a lot of the heavy lifting in Jaws 2, where really now it's he's one of only two or three returning characters. No, I guess it is four returning characters, but losing Richard Dreyfus and um, Robert Shaw. Robert Shaw. I don't know how I forgot Robert Shaw of all people because, you know, we've just been talking about Bond recently. But, um, <laughs> you know, you lose the two of them, and now it's really just him doing the heavy lifting from an acting standpoint. And it's really his movie telling his story. He's the one with the arc yeah. in the second movie. From beginning to yeah. end, he becomes the hero, saves the day. Where in the first film, he's one of three heroes, you know, and it's yes. one of three people who have their own characters, who have their own arcs. And Robert Shaw uh, arguably has two of the best monologues in film history in yeah. the first Jaws. So it does just become his movie. But I do agree with you. I, I didn't think of it from that point of view. Like the rest of the town hasn't seen this happen. It does look like a boat accident, especially with the, the water skier, you know, but it exploding like that you're more than likely able to believe it as a fire, even though Jaws himself ends up getting burnt like Freddy Krueger. I love that look for the rest of the movie with him getting being yeah, all burned. John, up. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, you've hit on, on a lot of things there, but yeah, I, I want to talk about, like, for example, um, Roy Shader, as I said, I think he, he, in a lot of ways, gives a better performance. And the whole thing is, is that what I like about Roy Shader in the second movie is that in the first movie, the arc is fitting into the community, right? fear of water, dealing with this force that he doesn't know or understand, an unlikely hero, he's yep. not expected to kill the shark, you know what I mean? Out of the three guys in the boat, he, he's at least experienced, you know, um, and, 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 there, and you wouldn't battle him to kill the shark. He does it. He overcomes the spears, defeats the, um, the nemesis, the evil, Mm -hmm. and where he is at the start of two to me is that he's a more reassured person he's accepted into the community he's got over the, his fear of water oh yeah they don't even really bring that up anymore and what we literally see then is a man descending into a bit of madness uh, paranoia uh, PTSD yep. of the fear this evil coming back at you He's terrified of coming back. And, and I hear fans turn and say, how can you be afraid? Sure, you killed the shark in the first one. Listen, there's people do heroic things in life, but they don't want to be put off as people. You know, there's there's uh, people that do things in the spur of the moment that save people from danger. But it doesn't mean they're going to always run in the, uh, or want to run in the uh, burning building. <laughs> do, do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And what I like about the art as well in the second movie is, is that because the town doesn't believe him, and he then loses his authority. He, he, he gets fired. He's no longer the chief no more. He loses that authority. And as you say about the, the bird on the side of the, the shark, I love that too. But you know what I love about that? Is that it differentiates the shark from the shark in the first movie. It does. And I, I think that that's something in the second film that I actually enjoyed was actually, I know some people I saw complaining about it, like biting the electric wire, but I actually enjoy the shark action scenes in the second movie a lot. You know, I, I think that the practical effects, even if it is just the mechanical shark again, which apparently had problems again, I don't know how you somehow have that happen <laughs> twice, but it actually does work. For that, you know, it even looks better than in Jaws 3 when the freaking shark is going towards the glass. Uh, one of the most ridiculous scenes in film history, in my opinion. But <laughs> it's yeah, Jaws 3 is a different story. Yeah. Um, not a problem, sir, with that. But 3D didn't help that movie. Mm -hmm. That's a different story. But I, I agree. Yeah, if you think with the shark, for a long way, I thought the shark in Jaws 2 looked a lot better than the shark in Jaws 1. Just had moods. There was actually footage that um, came out online a few years ago. 
I've been testing the shark and it actually like swimming through the water and it looks unreal. And I imagine this going, why is some of this not in the movie? This looks so good. Yeah. But I just think um, the actual skin of the shark and um, how it actually moves, it say to say and stuff, I think that that looks a lot better than the original shark. Uh, I think they definitely improved on that. But where I think they didn't improve from the first shark and the second shark, you watch the first movie, jo- the original Jaws has jaws. Yeah. These jaws that have done say the say of care. And the reason that was, was that so when it, when it opened its mouth and closed it again, if it didn't have the jaws, the, the, the edge of the mouth's mouth would pinch out because it's just rubber. Uh huh. So they made these jaws so it wouldn't pinch out and it might drop, drop down. So the whole idea was, was that we want rid of the jaws, we're going to perfect this. And they did, they perfected it. Um, that it could open its mouth and they might stretch rather than pinch and have the jaws. But the problem, I don't have an issue with the jaws being gone because uh, apparently Joe Alves, who, who had the day in the shark, says he's getting the jaws. But now it became like um, a characteristic of the original shark that the fans love. Yeah. Um, but the problem I have with the second shark was that it had a massive uh, underbait. You see behind the scenes photos of it. The bottom jaw comes right out. Um, yes. And it just looks a bit goofy. And it annoys me now. It bothers me now that I'm older. The second thing I don't like about the shark is the paint job. Um, the paint job isn't great. The, the white underneath looks grey rather than white. Uh, I don't understand why they, they say that they do that. Yeah, there's some some there's points like where you linger too long. You notice that it's rubbery, or you'll notice that in the center of it, it's like kind of sucking in a little bit. If you look for that stuff, it's there. And in the first jaws, what they did that I love is just that. It's, he's hidden. You don't really see him really too much to the very yes. end, and you don't linger on him enough for you to, you know, have enough time to study every aspect of it, which is just genius editing yeah. and, you know, great on set, on set shooting. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing as well that I that I I, I want to say as well is to defend Jaws two because look, Jaws two to me is it's one of my favorite movies. I'm, I I love the whole Jaws franchise. You know, I would watch all the Jaws movies at least once a year. I've already watched Jaws two uh, a month back. I'll defend Jaws 2. You know, I can't really defend 3 or 4. I'll, I'll do it humorously. I'll humor someone to defend 3 and 4. Um, but we'll maybe leave those for another chat, maybe at some stage. But I'll defend Jaws 2. And the reason I'll defend Jaws 2 is that because I genuinely don't think it's a bad movie. Jaws, no matter what I think of it, it is regarded as one of the best movies of all time. Yes. One of the greatest movies of all time. And it stood the test of time. Every generation, you know what I mean, knows what Jaws is and can appreciate Jaws. Uh, it's a nearly 50 years old. So what you have here is a sequel which going up against one of the best movies of all time. I mean, any movie, any you put any summer blockbuster up against Jaws and it's going to struggle, never mind the sequel. So I'm a great believer that the sequel that we got in 1978 for Jaws 3 was the best sequel that we were going to get at that time. And the reason we were going to get it, uh, the reason we, we got that, 90% of the cast and crew return for Jaws 3. Yeah, you just, the only thing that really hurts it is losing Spielberg. And it also didn't help that like Spielberg's comments initially were that he he wouldn't come back, obviously, and he didn't feel like he needed to because he had already made the perfect shark movie and there's no reason to dip his toes back into that water. And even now, Jaws mm-hmm. isn't allowed to get packaged in. So, like, the, there'll never be a Jaws box set because Jaws has to be yeah. sold separately from two, three, and four. So he always kind of even separates his film from the rest of the franchise to make it feel like, yeah, mine. His film kind of is more in competition with movies like Star Wars or like bigger, because like you said, it's considered one of the greatest films ever made. It's not considered one of the greatest horror movies. It's considered just one of the greatest movies. Like it's like yes. it, it gets ranked on top 10 all time films because it's yes. just a great movie. Whereas Jaws 2 considered a great great shark movie or a great sequel like in that sense of because you know losing spielberg does hurt it and you notice you lose that you lose that magic that spielberg feeling of it spielberg's movies all have a distinct feeling to he's an art tour in a way you see the funny thing is even when spielberg came back to do do i don't even think he would have been able to make a great sequel to it um because we've seen him do sequels before or since then um like for example the lost world sequel to jurassic park a lot of people hate it. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people don't make Campbell of Doom, even though that was a prequel, but even though they made Cru- Last Crusade, which was a great sequel. But yeah. Look at um, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. 
Yeah, that's the mega So, how many sequels? And, and if you take Indiana Jones out of it, because that's a, that was a trilogy, right? If you want to play that game, how many great sequels has Steven Spielberg made? No, it's true. It, he really, when he goes back to the well, it doesn't always work. Even yeah, even yeah. if you even keep Indiana Jones in there, it's very uneven in a sense. Like many people like go, okay, the Last Crusade. Like I, I argue, the Last Crusade is better than Raiders, but. I liked Last Crusade more, but it's still very formulaic because it feels very similar to Raiders. It's, it's, lo- it's like they took things that they invented with the Raiders and brought it to the Last Crusade. Yeah. It's just really how do you feel? Do you like, I prefer the father-son yeah. relationship over the romantic relationship, but that's personal yeah. taste. It it's doesn't mean he didn't more make... Refined. Yes, exactly. It's just more refined yeah. from a formula that he perfected. Raiders... That he, that he already done nearly 10 years earlier. Yep. You don't get Lost yeah. Crusade without Raiders, and you that's the, I always feel like that with any movie sequel. It's like you have to establish it, it, you can only be original once, it, it only can work yeah. one time perfectly, and then you're going back and you have to the fans are looking for certain aspects. And that's why I know you said Temple of Doom is your favorite. You got to give him credit for not even trying to go back to the well with Temple of Doom, it's a very original film, it, it's very different. Yeah. Um, I think maybe it's one of those things being expected watching it that was more exciting than Raiders and Last Crusade to me. So I've heard people uh, describe it as like a groups out movie. Maybe that appealed to me. But even now as I'm out it, I just find it more um, you know, than, than Raiders and Last Crusade. And that, we talked about it a few weeks ago. We said about Batman, it may be one of your favorite movies, but we can agree that it's not one of the greatest movies ever made. No. So I can sit here and say that Temple of Doom. Um, isn't a better movie than Raiders. I could argue it's better than Oscar Crusade. I know you prefer an Oscar Crusade. I understand why people do. I would never ever put it above Raiders as, say, if I was we're doing top 10 Spielberg movies, I wouldn't put Temple of Doom above Raiders. You know, but even though nine times, I get, nine times out of 10, I've watched Temple of Doom over Raiders. It's hard. Like, you kind of have to try and take your personal feelings out of certain aspects because you can recognize that a movie is better like if i was going to rank the indiana jones yeah i would put raiders at number two but no raiders is a better movie that's just for yeah. sure that's just it, it is it's yeah. the everything about that movie movie is a classic that movie's been satired and spoofed because it's an all-time great that's the thing with spielberg spielberg has at least five movies that are considered probably all-time great films one from probably each decade and it's just because yeah. he knows how to make a movie but his originals are always his best yeah, and, and you know what, the thing is about Jaws 2 as well, John, as, as I say, and I agree with you, Jaws 2, should I say, suffers because Richard James isn't in it, Robert Jaws, and it those personalities don't work. Um, but again, that was lightning in a bottle to get those three together and, and to create them characters and to have that dynamic of those characters. Now, some of the aspect of those characters goes back in the book. There's that kind of friction in the book, right? But what I believe, the reason why I believe those characters are so well-rounded and so defined is because the film uh, went over schedule and because of the problems that we're having at sea and with the mechanical shark, these guys were able to sit down and talk about their characters and rewrite the script daily and um, then go out the next day and try and film them. So they have the luxury of time. And, and I agree with you too. That, that to me is what makes Jaws an all-time great movie. It isn't that it's a shark movie. It's it's a movie about relationships. It's a movie about them three guys. And when I was younger, I was more um, fascinated and loved the second hour when we were in the boat. And no doubt that's the best part of the movie. No doubt about it. And the action sequences are absolutely brilliant. And John Williams scores outstanding. Amazing. But now, the older I get, I, I do start to enjoy the last stuff more. I don't know why that is. I really do just love the, the, the drama on the hand with and the officials and just appreciate the movie making aspect of what Spielberg was doing as we talked a few weeks back on one of the, the podcasts um, how he moves a camera how he blocks a scene he couldn't really he couldn't really make those decisions when he was out at sea because of the, the weather and because of the waves and the, and the water so I, I really do appreciate the first half of Walls just as much as the second now and it's all just set up you know, it's just set up, you know, this problem and just, this problem just mounts and it mounts and it mounts. And it's like, how, how are we going to overcome this? Now, when they went to do the sequel, the thing that people have to remember is, is that back in 1976, that sequel was being met. Jaws was still in the, the, the theaters, you know, or just came out of the theaters and they said, we're going to make a sequel here. No doubt about it. 
universe or one of the capital A's, the cash in on, on, on the success of Jaws. Of course, they did. Um, sequels, as we talked a few weeks ago, back on one of the podcasts, they weren't involved. Nobody was doing them. And the their attitude was, was that we're going to make a Jaws 2. And they asked Richard Zanuck and David Brown to produce it. And they first said no. They said the same. It was like recapturing the lottery. They said, how are we going to do this again? We can't do this again. But they said, well, if you don't do it, we're going to get somebody else to do it. And they said they felt protective of it. So they decided to get the crew back together and try and make a Jaws 2 as best as they could. They did offer it Spielberg. But Spielberg basically said that, um, as you say, he was being made, you know, he made the movie. He had such a hard time making Jaws. He had no desire to go back to the water again and try and make a Jaws 2. Yeah. Because he was making close encounters. His comments sounded like more aggressive back in the 70s. And then, mm-hmm. like, he's kind of cooled off and, like, kind of made comments and said, like, yeah, he just didn't want to go back. And, like, you just said, like, he didn't want to, he had such a bad time. He was afraid that would happen again. Which I, I don't blame him. Yeah. Like, if you have, like, a, a miserable experience where everything keeps going wrong, the natural human yeah. thing is, like, I'm just not doing that again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then if you see Spielberg now, he's asked about Jaws. Like, he's mellowed. I, I remember reading books back in the 90s um, by, by Spielberg on Jaws. And he, he seemed to me, when I read comments about Jaws, that he, he seemed a bit resentful of the movie. He seemed resentful of its success. Other than it was the movie that I was that made. It was a movie that made me, and I was able to make any movie I wanted after that. That's all he ever said. And he seemed to, in the mid two versions, when he seen the fan base, he, see, he seemed to mellow on it and maybe embrace it a bit more. But I think a lot of that resentment came from how hard it was to make. Plus, there was a bit of politics going on there too. You mentioned the editing, which, yes, it's outstanding. The editing is outstanding on Josh. Verna Fiend's done a tremendous job. And she won the Oscar. She got promoted within Universal Pictures. And she became one of the CEOs or something, or one of the executives, the first female executive of a major studio. And but there was talk in Hollywood that she saved the movie. I think we got a wee bit resentful about about a lot of that. That's just me speculating on what I've read over the years. Because when I what we seem to be in the nineties when I was reading about Spielberg, he was resentful. And then in the mid nineties, he seemed to kind of like mellow a wee bit and kind of like embrace the community and embrace Ross. Talk about it a wee bit more. Yeah, I, I think, like, I agree. I, I actually 100% agree with everything you said. I think that kind of, that shift in him kind of came around when he got to, oh, that's Faith, she says hi. <laughs> Hello, how you doing? Hi. <laughs> but I, I think exactly what happened was, I think it's around Raiders again, like George, because he had the failure of 1941, and he wanted to prove he could make a movie that came in under budget and everything like that. So I think he had that, like, that ambition he was a younger man in the 70s so when he was making even comments like through magazines and in interviews he kind of came off like like you said aggressive and like resentful in a way of like what happened and it just i think his experience was a little bit more negative even if the movie itself was a success and you know you know he made the blockbusters for him the way he looks at it was i had such a rough time in my my life making that movie yes. that i don't look at that movie as a positive even if you know really it opens so many doors for him but his experiences it's like david fincher with alien 3 like that opened doors for him but he had such a miserable time making it it's hard for him to look back at it at it yeah. in any sort of positive light because of his experience in his life at the time yeah and i and i think as well like you say he was young he had other projects he wanted to do do, do you know do you know like i said earlier there was a thing making the movie where he was doing himself where he was like, yeah, I want to be one. He actually said, apparently he said, yeah, I want to be known as a truck and shark director. He he, he was making Close Encounters at the time. And I love Close Encounters with third time. If I had a choice, I don't know, Spielberg come back and direct Jaws 3, right? So you don't have the Jaws 3 you have now, but you have a different Jaws 3. I'm like, don't get Close Encounters. <laughs> no, I, I'll pick Jaws 3 because I love Jaws 3 and I love Close Encounters. It's one of my favorite movies. It's the best of both worlds for me. I'm just not convinced that Spielberg could have made a better Jaws 3 and Marvel got. Just like Jaws, Jaws 3 had a different director attached and he was set. He was fired and the production was shut down. Mm-hmm. And they apparently they reached out to Spielberg again and they, and they asked him again, would, would you direct this? And apparently it was 4th of July weekend and he actually said himself, he said that I'm, I read this somewhere, I can't remember where it's wrong. So he says he spent the whole of the 4th of July weekend looking for a, a, an alternative to a Jaws sequel, a Jaws 2, but still in the same realm. Like, I've seen talk over the years about the USS Indianapolis story, you know, and I've seen fans over the years say, say that that's the Jaws sequel that you should make and should make it with a young Quinn. But as a multiverse type of thing, 
I would love to see that. But as the, the producer said in the documentary, Jaws 2, that's not Jaws, that's not Jaws 2. That would Maybe be a great Jaws movie. Too. That would be an awesome movie. I would love to see that yeah. movie. But do you know there's already three movies about USS and the Ops? Yeah, but I want to see the one that that he would have made with a young, you know, with a young yeah, Robert man. Shaw and yeah. his story and what he went through. Like, make him yeah. the focal point of the movie. I want to see that movie. Yeah, the U.S. in Indianapolis, uh, that's a great story in general. But to see it from Spielberg's point of view and in the 1970s, that would have been really interesting. Well, I suppose, I suppose so. Uh, maybe in a hindsight, it would have uh, done, done better than, than Jaws 2. Uh, I, that I don't know, though, actually, because... You, how do you sell? Do you call it Jaws Two, the USS Indianapolis, or do you call it just something completely different? Because the Jaws Two name, I definitely think at the time is going to sell tickets. Yeah, and do you know that the two in Jaws it was the first ten in movies they'd ever used uh, the, uh, the number two in a movie? I didn't know that. That's crazy. I didn't know. I would have assumed that Planet of the Apes was the second one would have been called Planet of the Apes too. I, I, but you're right. That's a hundred percent. I didn't even realize that. The second one's called. Is it? It's called Return to Planet of the Apes. I think so. I know the third one is called Beyond Planet of the Apes. <laughs> but yeah, I can't remember. So that was the first thing. So, so I, I think that uh, the producers were kind of like they, they actually say in the negative argument. We came to the conclusion we had a, a lot of different writers in the three about different ideas, and we came to the conclusion that what audience would want to see is Amity Island and Brody and a spot again. And that's the thing as well that it's the regular that Jaws do that's too similar to the first movie. But you got again, we gotta remember who, like I said earlier, sequels weren't a thing back then. It's not like now. You know, pe- people want to build into take as much risk. It was kind of like, okay, we'll have this real big success with Jaws. It's a giant shark at this short small resort. We have the chief, chief of police there. He's got to stop it from eating the swimmers. So that's where the second one will pick up. Another one comes back. Um, and he's got to deal with it. And what I actually like about it as well, as much as the movie does suffer with not having maybe more stronger kind of like adult um, characters in it. But I like that. It's different then. It's Brody on his own. You know, he can't fall back on uh, Hooper or Quint to try and stop, stop Shark this time. He has to do it by himself. And that whole second half of the movie out in the water, it's a different movie then. It's not the same as Jaws. It's out in the water. It's split up in two like the first movie, land, water. But instead of three guys out in the boat hunting the shark, you've got a bunch of teenagers now who are actually just drifting in the sea. And it's a race against time for Bodo. He's not on a mission to go for the shark. He's in a race against time just to save children. Yeah. And circumstance just happens that he's able to kill him. He comes the hero once again. And I really do love the electrified ending with, with the bar. Yeah, well, it's not as good as the first movie with a tank, but I just really love that ending. Yeah, that feels like your typical uh, horror movie ending where we have to up the last movie kind of thing. So it's like, I got an idea. Here's what we're going to do. And it's timed perfectly. I love that, actually. That that I do love. I love the ending to the second one. But there's one thing I want to ask you. Have you you've read the, yeah. the book for Jaws 2? Yes. So I want I I don't think I was talking to you about it. I think it was somebody else in the comments of my Jaws two review. But I didn't realize this is that his deputy, who ends up becoming the actual, eventually becomes the sheriff because he ends up getting fired. That he's having a relationship with Brody's wife. Is that something that's in the book? No. No. Okay. So that's wrong. Somebody said that that was something sure. that was going on, and that's why when he comes home, like he's kind of a, like he's drunk, and he kind of and his deputy's already there talking to his wife. Like that's that's the reason why, but no, he's just really there to just kind no. of comfort him. Okay. No, he's, he's, Hendrix is there because that's that goes back to what I was saying about I respected Brody and Chloe in the community, and here's this respected facial who, who saved the town four years earlier. Because Jaws three takes place four years later, and a lot of people don't realize that because it was a state of. But when I had the VHS set on the back of it three years later, you know, now <laughs> when you're streaming something, it doesn't end of that, right? So, no. um, no, he's just there because he, he loves Brody and respects him and admires him. And you hear him saying that yeah, I think we're the best. He, he just thinks that he should still be the chief. Yeah. You, you know? He didn't want to take the job. Season. Yeah, he was like, I'll quit too. Yeah. <laughs> I'll quit too. But in the next day when he sees him, John, he's still saying, he's still calling him chief. 
Yeah. He still respects him as his chief. But I was like, when the guy commented that and he wrote that, I was like, okay, that makes the scene feel completely different. Like, it almost makes it, would it would make me look at him like as a whole different character than when I watched the movie. Because the movie doesn't have that. The movie, I look at this guy as a, you know, a loyal servant in a sense. And I respect yeah. you and everything you did. And I would never step on your toes or anything like yeah. that. But, you know, he's drunk Brody and everything, and he's kind of coming off like a little bit, you know, he's upset. I completely understand it after what happens. So I I actually, that's one of my favorite scenes in the movie, too. I I love scenes like that, though, where the guy's got to play drunk and everybody else is like around him and you just see him just unraveling. I I love that scene. I I actually really love that scene as well, because that's the difference between they got, the, the Jaws 2 was a summer blockbuster you could argue Jaws 2 was the first sequel summer blockbuster so not only do you have Jaws it's the first summer blockbuster you have Jaws 2 the first sequel summer blockbuster right but yep. those quieter moments I mean Jaws and Jaws 2 they're more I remember my, my brother actually showed Jaws to his daughter um, a few years ago she'd never seen it before and um, he messages me and says um Daughter was me and daughter was Jaws. I haven't seen it in so long. It's such a great movie. And she she's asking, she wants me to ask you, was that a horror movie? <laughs> and I responded back to him, yeah, and I wasn't being funny. Like I responded back and it says, Yes, but it's also an adventure film. It's a thriller, it's an adventure movie, it's a comedy, it's a drama. You know, it, it's got everything. And I think Jaws too, in a lot of ways, is the same. It's got those low key dramatic moments. Yes. Between, you know, um, Roy and the town, Roy and his wife, you know, even with his son on the beach, after he shoots up the, the, the beach with a school of bluefish. And I love this scene as well. This is, this is what I mean about it being one of my favorite sequels. Yeah. And one of my favorite films, I was going to say earlier, it's one of my favorite sequels. If I was to pick a top 10 sequels of all time, I'd have to be Jaws to be in there. When he shoots the bluefish and he turns around and everybody's looking at him and he's embarrassed and he's yeah. shocked and he's hard. And, and, and Alan as well, she's upset. If you watch Jaws once, it always backs him. Yeah. Always backs him, no matter what. Right? She's yeah. bad saying. After a... that scene, she walks away. Yeah, she's the like. The first time she walks away on, she's horrified. She's shocked. Like, what are you doing shooting on a beach full of people? Yeah, well, he, like, lost it in front of everybody. Even that's, like, what, what happens in, like, at the town hall. Like, I understand. I, I'm starting to see it from your point of view now. Like, yeah, they all would look at him as, like, he's starting just to unravel. Like, that's... For him to do that in front of everybody and to be so sure of himself, that's what's going on. Yeah, yeah. It's going to be hard for everyone to believe you now. Like, and then we got to keep you as our chief of police. Uh, I, yeah. I get why they did it. I get it. I get it. I was going to say, I, I get it now. Yeah, like why they, I understand, especially like when he goes to the town hall and they're all there and like, it almost feels a little bit like they're ganging up on him, but he's just, he looks so manic and crazy in that moment. Yeah, and like when he gets thrown into the water, and the, the, one of the boys isn't out of the water yet and he shoots past him. And I watched it a few weeks ago with my daughter and um, when he started ra- ra- ringing the bell and coming down and pulling the gummy, like she, she's only eight. She turned around and said to me, "What's he doing with all those people there?" Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I said, "Yeah, really see what he's gonna do." Yeah, he's shoot past the kid coming out of the water. Yeah. So the point of that scene I really like, John, is that who comes down and helps him with the bullets yeah. or the, the shells or the sand? Sean. Yeah. And that harkens back to the first movie where Sean and him have this wee bit of a relationship. Where Sean's sitting doing the impressions uh, at the dinner with him you know it's still his dad yeah. he still loves him he doesn't care what he's done he's the only one who comes down and helps him when everybody's clear out of the beach and home and I know it's melodramatic you know that's clear out folks everybody go home nothing to see here yeah. and he's on his own on the beach with the sun going down mm-hmm. but those kind of scenes and then when you say about the town hall scene that, that's one of my favorite that probably is my favorite scene in the whole movie when he goes it in front of everybody mm-hmm. and he says you know I'm really good I'm telling everybody this table that's a shark and I know the shark looks like because I've seen one up close. And you better do something about this one because I don't want to do that again. I love that scene too. Like those are the scenes. That's why I, you know, as much as like, that's why I still don't think Jaws too. Like I don't love it as much as you, but I still think it's pretty good. Is I like those moments. They're the same moments that I like in the first Jaws. I can appreciate those great acting scenes. And Roy Schneider just does a phenomenal job in Jaws too. He really is. He he carries the movie for me. That's what I said in my original review. He's like, he is the movie. Without him, that movie would be awful because he just he's putting on a world class performance. And from what I was able to read, is that. 
he didn't even want to do it. Like he almost like was uh like uncooperative back like behind the cameras, and yet somehow when he gets in front of the camera, he's out there giving just an acting class. <laughs> but do you know what the funny thing is about uh, Roy Shader is is that all this stuff's coming out now all these years later about the production and stuff. And um, you're right, he, he didn't want to do it. Why would you? You know, you've just made one of the best films of all time at that particular time, the biggest box office a grossing movie of all time, right? And and it was a nightmare for everybody to film. And then they're coming along and saying he wanted to do Draws 2. Now, Roy Shader was a contract player at Universal. Yeah. He had two movies left on his on his contract. And his next movie he was doing was Deer Hunter. Uh, but he didn't make the ending of the Deer Hunter. He didn't make the end of it. So no. he basically walked out and says, I'm not doing it because it would make the ending. So Universal came and says to him, you can't break your contract. However, <laughs> if you do Jaws 2, we'll count it as two pictures, two films. Yeah. And your contract will be over. So we agreed. So, you know, when people say that he didn't want to do it, look, this is annoying. I've been seeing a lot of this on main reason me, John, because of Strollers Peace 45th anniversary, and I've been reading the comments and some of them have been annoying me. I said and I said to myself, if he didn't want to do it, he wouldn't have done it. He would have just went and done the air up there. The fact of the matter is he he he, he did wanna he did want to do it to get out of his contract. He, you know, he, he was there. They had two different directors. The first director was interviewed recently. He's still there. He's in his eighties, and they asked him about Roy Shader being difficult. And you know what he said, he says Roy was fine with me. I never had a bad word with him since he was brilliant. Gotcha. Right. It was when the second director came on. Oh. Uh, okay. What happened was was that the director, this second director, came on and had a week to prepare because they were already on location. Everything was there. The shark was there. You know, the film crew was there. The teenagers were there. He had a week to prepare. So what he done was he streamlined the cast. He got rid of a lot of teenagers. He thought there was too many teenagers. Mm -hmm. And he started concentrating on action set pieces because the shark wasn't working. And they, he says they could work on the shark. They could rewrite the script because he didn't like the script. He thought it was weak. So we've got to rewrite it. And he says, we can do the action set pieces. And apparently from what I've read and what I've seen is that Roy Shader got a bit frustrated that, he, that the director wasn't giving him as much attention as the teenagers and other things that were going on in set. And this director, General Schwartz, he just says that uh, we had a, an argument, we had a fight. Apparently, there was almost a Disney Cup, still almost end up on each other. And it was broken up. Roy Shader said to him, you're, you're not paying me any attention. And apparently, he says, Roy, you're a seasoned boy. You're an actor. He says, these teenagers are hard. He says, of course, I'm giving them a lot of time because they need it. You don't. I guess that's true. And uh, I do feel like the teenagers are the weakest part of the movie, to be honest with you, as far as acting goes. <laughs> so, you know, maybe the director was right. Yeah. Maybe they did need a little bit more work. Yeah. And apparently the talk was, was that Roy would only show up for scenes then. And when, he, when they weren't filming, he would strip down his speedos and some bits. <laughs> uh, well, he... And then he was getting so calm. <laughs> that they had the color correcting in post production. I was gonna say he looks pretty tan, so but he looks tan in the first draws too. So I don't know, maybe. He, and um, I don't know when it came out around here or if Universal even did it, but Marathon Man in the seventies too is pretty tan in that. <laughs> he was Roy Shader. Uh, actually, seemed to like the song of that. Um, yeah, he was doing it for a bit of sunbeam in the first draws as well. Mm -hmm. So apparently, in this like um, the production designer Joe Alves, he was the associate producer in Jaws too. He had the Golium along with, who was it he go with? He was saying, I don't know if it was one of the, the, the cameramen, uh, the director of photography, and say, Roy, can you stop sunbathing? Because yeah. you're, you're not matching up in the scenes. And he just went, he just went, yeah. he was going to continue to sunbathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's probably like, I, I don't care. All right, the sun's outside, I'm going to stand. So you're going to have to deal mm -hmm. with it. <laughs> uh -huh. So listen, I've rambled on and off a lot here about Jaws because actually I'm very passionate about it and I love the movies. But, but I say, what, 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 what is it that I know you respect Jaws and you give it a watch, and um, it is becoming a very American thing that I watch Jaw, Jaws over the Fourth of July, which is great because it's all everybody's talking about Jaws over the Fourth of July. Now. But um, what is it that that just doesn't appeal to you about about that movie? It's just, I, I don't know what it is. Like, it just doesn't, like, I don't get invested as much in that movie. Like, I appreciate so much about it. Like, I appreciate those scenes. I appreciate 
pretty much everything about it i respect it like even from all like i'm a big horror film fan and this is a lot of people's like we'll put this on the scariest film of all time i really do think it's the shark thing i'm just not interested in sharks like i don't go and watch any shark movies i don't go out of my way for it i never cared about shark week i have never had any interest and really like just the ocean in general like there's stuff like i watched like the abyss or i watched Waterworld recently but like that's just something that doesn't pique my interest so when i'm watching this i'm watching it just from a film standpoint so i'm there yeah. for like the, the i'm there for the scenes of dialogue that that's what will keep me coming back those scenes are like perfect but anytime even the very end of the movie when they're fighting the shark you know and they got yes. those things with the barrels and i think that stuff is cool but i i i couldn't really care <laughs> like like i'm yeah. not interested in it at all and like that's just that's a personal thing i know that because yeah. for a lot of other people they're at the edge of their seats and i'm sitting there and i'm looking at them like ah, it's just not doing it for me i think that close encounters like i heard you say like you know it'd be tough for you like because you love close encounters i love close encounters i think that's the second best movie that spielberg ever did so we're gonna have to do that yeah. on the show one day because oh, uh, 100%. Yeah. i know close encounters. that's actually i agree jaws for me is spielberg's best movie and close encounters is his second best that that's the order i have them well, at least we agree that that's his second best job. Yeah, Richard Dreyfus is perfect. And I have a lot to say about Richard Dreyfus in that movie. We'll have to save it because we've already gone an hour 10 on this one. But, uh, I mean, yeah. Richard Dreyfus, he's perfect in that just as much as he's perfect in the original Jaws. You know, everyone does such a good job acting in those movies. I just wish I got invested in the actual shark stuff. I think I get invested yeah. more in, like you were saying on the first act, like how they're running the town mm -hmm. and all that stuff kind of in a world nowadays really stands out, especially after what happened with the pandemic. Like we all know that... Yeah. That's how people will run their cities. Is they uh, money is important, and, and you need it. Though I get that. Should you look at recently when that fellow was killed by the the shark in Egypt only only a month ago by the tiger shark? The village went out straight away with a big net and caught the tiger shark, and they said it was the the, the culprit. They put it along the beach and beat it to death. And I think they closed the beach for a few days. But you know that's that's the most extreme the word that because that was caught on camera. That was horrific. I I, I have seen. Shark attacks on video, but that was horrific. I've never seen anything like that. It actually reminded me of Chrissy at the start of Jaws getting dragged into the water. I don't know if you've seen it, it's horrific. That was being around the world, so that's them. It was kind of shown to the world that we've dealt with our shark problem, it's safe. Yeah, you can go in the water, don't worry about it because it's all to do with money. And that's basically like talk about why is Jaws endured from a movie making standpoint. We'll discuss some of why it's endured, conceding the shark. You act in, you know, it's it's not it's not a over elaborate story, but there's a story there. Art reflects life, and then life is now reflected art. That kind of age old story of you know money over people's safety. Yeah, it hasn't changed in fifty years. Nope. And it probably never will, and unless and as our planet continues to always be, uh, money is the almighty power. It's not countries; it's money. <laughs> so it's, unfortunately, it's, it's money. Yeah. yeah, money is the root of all evil, John. Yep. It is. Once we put that into our worldwide existence, that's it. That's that's the god is money, unfortunately. It destroys everything. It and, does. And that's the thing as well. Like what you're saying about what you like about is the interplay between the characters. Is that I, I even get that on the boat. That I love that kind of niggling. Like when the first go out on the boat and Richard Dreyfus crushes the cup and, and Robert Shaw crushes the beer can and, and there's Brody's kind of looking at them, not knowing what he's doing and putting this thing in the and the screw the tanks fall down and the next thing is Dreyfus is shooting at him and and, and then um Quint is saying next time you ask me which name the crew you know I mean don't you let him get one over on you, you know what I mean? I won't let take it. I won't let him get one over on you, you just ask me. Yeah. <laughs> you see, all that, you know, even like what afterwards when, when the hook you think they've hooked the shark, Dreyfus says it's not a shark and uh Quint then comes down and says, Don't you tell me my business. He says, You go back on the bridge. I think Bruce says it doesn't prove a damn thing, and Quinn says it proves one thing: it proves that you wealthy college boys don't have the education enough to admit when you're wrong. <laughs> Just those great legs that interplay and Cruz's past Dreyfus on yeah. his chest, and Dreyfus Dreyfus is playing him. Does that feel you know what I mean? Just I love all that, and like you say, that kind of drama on the boat that goes into the Indianapolis speech, you know, which is one of the greatest to me, one of the greatest acting performances of all time, and he should have won the Oscar for that alone. Man, a shaggy skin. Lifeless eyes, black eyes like a doll's eyes. 
He should have. And uh, I've read behind the scenes stuff, and maybe I can get some confirmation from you on that. That uh, it's edited together through parts where he was really drunk, and then there's other parts where he did it sober. Is that a hundred? Is that true? Yes. So, yes. There's there's a story that um, we're in the cabin. The three principals are supposed to be drunk. Robert Shaw liked the drink, and he asked Steven Spielberg. Can I have a few drinks? Because the lads were supposed to be drunk in the scene. And Spielberg went, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> so by the time they set the scene up, it says Robert Shaw basically had to be carried into the cabin. <laughs> 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 and he says he, he started the speech brilliantly. And then he started waffling. <laughs> then he started talking about all this personal stuff. Now, there's a book that I have here. And this is the only place that I've actually read this and it came from John Millius who you heard about this from people who were on the set he was having an affair with his maid Robert Shaw okay. and he started telling everybody about it in between the speech Okay. and of course they had the rap because you think he's brutal you know yes. and it's at the home and he woke up at 3 in the morning and telephoned Spielberg <laughs> and said to Spielberg how bad did I embarrass you <laughs> and like Spielberg tells the story he actually when Spielberg tells the story Spielberg says I don't want to go into what he was saying so there's a bit of truth there yet what, what was he talking about but um, Spielberg says that was the type of actor he was he didn't phone up and say how badly did I embarrass myself uh-huh. just how badly did I embarrass you the director Spielberg says not lately and Robert Shaw says can I do it again first thing tomorrow morning and Spielberg says no problem and he set it up he says he came in first thing the next morning Stone Cold Sober, done the speech from start to finish perfectly. And what you see in the movie is intercut between him drunk and sober. And okay. that's how great of an actor he is. See, that's awesome. All right. So I, I want, I knew you would know for sure with that because I've read it, but you know, conflicting reports on things. So I wanted to make sure because, uh, I yeah. th- that's, um, that's awesome. First of all, great editing and yeah, yeah. great acting. Like, I, you know, I'll do it drunk, I'll do it sober. And then, you know, you find the perfection in there somewhere. But, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a phenomenal he, actor. He was probably thinking that the wrong thing to use the part. He probably was like, I went and do this, and then that's the scene done. Um, I don't even know if Robert Shaw knew that's what they did. I don't know. Because he died in 1978, a couple of years after Jaws. Yeah, it's sad, actually. He didn't make it that long. He, he actually died. Um, he lived in Ireland. He lived on the, the west coast of Ireland. Oh, really? That's where he died. Yes, he, he, has a, he had a house out there. That's where he lived from the early 1970s. And um, from what I'm aware of, he was cremated in Belfast. Okay, I was going to ask you where his final resting place was because I know I read it, but I don't remember. <laughs> like, but uh, yeah, I should, that's terrible. Yeah. Such a great I actor. Think that so Southern Ireland was so Catholic at that time that they, I don't think they have crematoriums. I could be wrong. I'm near certain that they didn't because you know back then, sadly, you know, very religious country. You know, you had to be if you were you know majority Catholic. I think that you, you would be buried. Could be wrong, but. That, because I, I'm wondering why. Why did he come from the West Coast over to Belfast and the, the north of Ireland, in the Northern Ireland, be cremated? You know, um, so the yeah, age cremated. He actually got to a place called Tour and they actually a few years ago there they erected a memorial to him um, in Irish, Irish language. You know, Robert Shaw lived here. I can't remember what else it says. Oh. That's awesome, though. I mean, not awesome that he died, but like, yeah, I, I, it's crazy that that to have a memorial to him and everything. And he deserves it. Uh, of all the actors, he's definitely everyone. I think agrees that his performance in this movie, in the first draws, is probably the best of the three. I think, right? Oh, yeah, oh yeah, hundred percent. Like, I mean, I wouldn't hundred and say that he made the movie. Um, I just feel as if the, the three of them together just just made like, Robert Shaw. When you watch Robert Shaw and draws. To me, you can't take your eyes off him. No. When he first comes on the scene, when he scrapes the fifth fingernails down the blackboard, you're captivated. Every time he's on the scene, you're captivated. But I just think that, you know, for him, the way he plays off the other characters and they all play off each other, it's just a perfect kind of like a, um, trio of characters. They all have different temperaments and different personalities, different backgrounds even. You know, and I remember a few years ago, I remember, because they're always... Because that's one thing I love with Jaws, and I said, I saw it earlier, John, in, in the pod, was that I wanted to learn, learn about how it was made, and I'm still learning new things. And like um, somebody even put up recently about um, when you think about it, the shark was defeated by Hooper's scuba tank and Quince rifle, and it was Brody the dog. Yeah. So they took the three of them really together to defeat the shark in the end. 
I get, oh, wow, that is a perfect analogy. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And you're right. It's mm-hmm. honestly, and that's what I, that's what I say, how I can appreciate Jaws is because it, it, you're a hundred percent right. They're three different characters and they developed all three of them perfectly. You find out everything you need to know, even though like, you know, Robert Shaw's character is, gets there about halfway through the movie. Obviously Brody gets the most development from the beginning, but all yes. three of them are developed perfectly. They're all different. They don't feel generic. Nothing about their full flushed out characters in this movie. Yeah. And the thing about Brody is Bro- Brody's the audience. He's the guy. So, so you're watching it through Brody's eyes. Yeah. So so the thing is, is that, that, that you follow him for most of the movie. So even though he's a, he's an authority figure and not everybody in life is an authority figure, but he's a family man. Mm-hmm. He's a father. He's, he's concerned about his children. A lot of people can relate to that being in a family, having people to care about, whether it's a younger brother, a younger sister, or your dad. Yep. You know, I watch it differently now. When I when I was a kid, I made it look at Brody's because like, you know, my dad, right? Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? I'm not saying that Brody was. I'm saying you know, the that the, 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 an adult. You know what I mean? A father. You know. He's a father. Now that I am a father myself, I probably look at the kids as if my kids. You know what I mean? Or my own kid will be in danger. Yeah, so we're, we're watching um, the movie through his eyes. And look, not everybody gets by to see. Not everybody's a fisherman. So while he's learning about sharks, the audience is learning about sharks. Because not everybody knows about sharks. You know, when he's with Ken, you know, he doesn't want to about fishing. They're learning him about fishing. So we're learning about fishing. You know what I mean? So, so Brody is a sense of the audience. We're seeing this story unfold through his eyes. Yeah, even from the time he gets to Amity, like he's literally learning about the entire town while we're learning yes. about it. So it's yeah, it's the perfect place, the perfect character to give exposition to, because he's learning yeah. it as we're learning. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, which all makes yeah. perfect sense, and I understand what you're saying. The movie stays the same, but you know you've changed. So now you look at the movie different. You look, you can relate to the father in him now. So that makes sense. When you were a kid, yes. you can relate to the kids. I get that. <laughs> There's a different perspective there. There mm-hmm. is, and I remember being six. Dad made years of age when Jaws was on TV. I remember like Jaws, Jaws 2, Jaws 3, like sitting on my own dad and me in the room watching the movie. And I suppose there's a bit of comfort there. You know what I mean? Um, nostalgia. That, you know what I'm saying? So that's what I'm saying. So you have that kind of in the movie about a family and, you know, a packer figure and slaying the beast and all this. And, and now when I watch it, my daughter sits with me. You know, it's that, it's that kind of generational thing that I think um, is why as well the Jaws um endure, endures because when i am on like jaws like facebook pages or whatever it may be like i see people my age in their 40s now sure in this movie with their kids and their kids love it and that's a joy as well because there's not there's not a lot of movies old movies you can do that with i don't think no not from the 70s and it's funny because i'm a little bit younger than you but i have cousins that were younger than me and they absolutely love love jaws so it just continues to get passed out from generation to generation just like you said earlier it just stands the test of time and it's because it's a very yeah. relatable story um there's not stuff in here that's going to date it too much you know going to the beach on independence day that's all stuff that still goes on sharks you know they haven't changed because they haven't evolved enough like to change at all so everything other than like cars and certain aspect like this is an ageless movie oh yeah it definitely is and i don't think there's anything in it that dates it because it is the, the sad regional codes ways or anything like that. Um, you know, look, us tendons on the involved and our heads are all stuck in our phones in this day and age. And even that doesn't deter you from watching the movie. You don't sit and think to yourself when they're stuck out at sea, why don't they just use their smartphone and phone for help? <laughs> you know, because you're just engrossed in the story. Yeah. It's it, it doesn't, I, I, it's actually something for a story for another day. I was thinking about that recently. Like, are movies going to start incorporating phones just more and more and more as time goes on? Because it makes me worried. <laughs> in a lot of ways, too. It's one of those movies as well. Even though, to me, it's a, it's a movie that came out in the 70s. And it's, it's, um, it's not dated the way it looks or nothing. But to me, it's still set in the 70s. You know, this, this story didn't happen last year. This story didn't happen, you know what I mean, two years ago. It still happened. The story still happened in the 70s. You know, but it's not dated in a sense that when you sit down to watch it and go, this movie's old. You know, you can, it looks like it was filmed last year. That's how good it looks. It does. Um, so to me, it's still set in the 70s, but, it, but it, it's as fresh as yesterday. You know, 
Yeah, well, you don't need cell phones. When you're on the beach, most people like are worried about their phones getting wet or messy, so they leave them away. So that kind of helps it, too. Um, the only, only yeah. thing that would kind of date it is like the way like they have to talk to the land, you know, is with a phone on the boat or, you know, uh, yeah. a radio instead like now. And like, yeah, you just pick up a cell phone and call somebody, you know, they'd have computers everywhere. But I also love that, though, because it gives that claustrophobic feeling again of being on the boat. Just these three guys, they're stuck with each other and they got to appreciate yes. each other. <laughs> so I, I, that's something that I'm glad that we don't have that aspect of. <laughs> Yeah, and then they have to learn to get on with each other yeah. to overcome this problem. Yeah. You, you know, I'm saying about the, the, the phones and stuff, something that just made me laugh for a long time now, though, for about this is the difference between we're talking about things being dated or whatever. Things, and then this, this is something that doesn't stand out to me and Joss, but it stands out to me and Joss, too. After the, the speedboat explodes and Brody gets called to the beach and Hendrix is deputies out on the police boat. Did you see the size of Brody's walkie talkie? Yeah. Did you see it? It's twice the size of his head. Yeah. And then the antenna is about six, six feet up the air. Yeah, just to probably reach 10 feet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was something that stuck out to me for a long time now. Maybe mid 2000s, maybe in the early 2000s. I was like, Jesus, look at the size of that walkie talkie. Yeah. So, I mean, that hasn't been as well. Um, a couple of things too about Jaws 2. Did you notice the, the yellow bar that said Brody's house? Yeah, I assume that was a call back to the original one, right? <laughs> yeah, that's one of the bars he obviously came home on with Richard Cooper. Yep, I, I, which I love how in the first one that scene is shot. It's shot beautifully because, again, real water. I, I love how that scene is shot with the, the spotlight. With, with swimming away. Yeah. At the beach at the end. Yeah. Listen, see that, that, that John Williams music at the end of that movie? I, I absolutely love it. Yeah, that's one of John Williams' best scores. I mean, obviously, but the guy, I mean, John Williams has scores. Just It's ridiculous how many scores he has that are iconic. He's, he is the best, right? I think he's the best. I mean, you know, again, Jaws is my favorite soundtrack of all time, score of all time. And I actually think Jaws 2 is a cool second. I think the Jaws 3 soundtrack is outstanding. And that's another reason why I defend Jaws 3. It's because when we talk about um, most of the main players coming back to make the second movie, and I, I think his Jaws 2 soundtrack is absolutely amazing. Um, and one thing I actually like about his soundtracks is for Jaws is that they're not repetitive. Okay, people will turn around and say, yes, the Jaws theme is uh, repetitive. You know, they go da 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 but The thing is, is that it's not really. If you listen to the scores, the Jaws themes there, but it's variations on the theme. Yeah. You know, or it's variations on the theme added in with, like, uh, the Orca thing, you know, the Heroes thing. Um, you know, each track on those albums, not one of them will be the same or even similar. Every single one of them are different. Well, Jaws Maybe the same tunes, but they're done on a different arrangement. Yeah, the Jaws two soundtrack. Is, I mean, the score itself is very different from the first one. I think actually I was reading that John Williams was trying to go for something a little bit more uh, romantic and fun or adventurous in comparison to the first gotcha. one, which was a little bit more, you know, obviously more horror. Uh, leading yeah. so it, it doesn't feel like you could argue like it doesn't feel like the same at all it's not a let's do it again kind of thing Jaws 2 definitely has a very different score than the first one and I think it works actually it works for the film um, there's actually a very good um, feature out on the, the Blu-ray or the 4K um, where John Williams talks about the Jaws 2 score um, and he actually says that and I couldn't believe this when I first seen this uh, uh, 23 22 years ago now yeah, that, that, that documentary is he says that when he starts it a new score, even for a, a sequel. He says he never looks back. So we never went back to Jaws and looked at Jaws and went, right, we're going to do this in the second movie. Um, he actually said at that particular time as well, it's, this goes back to sequels too. The idea of a theme coming back wasn't a thing. It, it, it's it's crazy because like you would think that that iconic score and theme in general, you would bring it back because that's what people are going to be expecting. But that's something that he has mm -hmm. always done. Like even with the Star Wars movies and the Indiana Jones, he never really does. Re Obviously, they have it already recorded so they could pipe it in there what they want. But he always seemed like he wanted to do something new, it, you know, maybe feel similar, but it doesn't fe it does still feel original. Well, he did say that bringing things back wasn't really a thing. He says, but the Jaws thing, the shark thing, was a given that he knew it had to be back. And he says on that, that's been a while since I watched it, but he basically says that that's the reason why he says there's differences between the shark theme in the first movie and the second movie. 
and it, it is a, the theme in the second movie just feeds a bit more than just the shark thing that that's you know it, he was told that there was a bit more action in the second movie see he he was I think he was scoring Superman at the time oh yeah he would have uh, been yeah yeah at the time he was asked to do Jaws 2 yeah and because they were they were behind schedule because they did the first director and brought on the second director and filming went on to December 1977 I don't think he's seen much of the footage. Um, so he was just told by the director. The director says it's a very youthful score, says there's more action, um, and there's, there's a lot more underwater. So if you notice the Jaws 2 score has a lot more harps in it and things like that, like underwater music and all that stuff, beautiful to listen to, John, it really is. Um, so that's what he says is the reason why there's differences between Jaws 1 and Jaws 2. So he had to kind of start writing the score just based on... Uh, verbal uh what the, what the movie was going to be before um he's seen any kind of like footage or anything and i do i i hate the fact that it's it's an underrated score when people talk about john Williams' music nobody ever mentions jaws too they always talk about the usual raiders and you know jurassic park and of course jaws and, and star wars and movies like that um it annoys me too as well because even campbell of doom i think is underrated and that and that's a sequel yeah I another don't... score i love too is the lost word I think when he does a follow-up score, they're better than the originals most of the time. And but, nobody ever knows. No, because this is a guy who's got scores, who's scored like literally some of the greatest movies ever. It's insane how many different movies he's actually scored. He scored not only everything you just brought up, but then he's on Superman, Harry Potter. So it, it's just, it's not fair, really. And then they're always going to bring up the, the the main themes of those. You know? Yeah, I, that's what they do. They just bring up the main themes. And funny enough, they... I was actually listening to a John, John uh, Williams um, concert uh, last, last summer. Um, it was on YouTube, and I made a comment saying that, you know, it's great and all. I says, um, but, you know, why do not play, like, for example, uh, think it's, say, the box and play, like, a different track from Jaws or a different track from, say, The Empire Strikes Back? Or why don't we play the Temple of Doom thing instead of maybe just the, the Raiders March? And somebody replied and made a, made a good point saying, look, that's okay for people that are really into his music, but when somebody does a concert, it's more for the casual to come along and go, oh, that's Jaws, oh, that's EP, oh, that's Raider, or that's the Apple Bones, and, and that's a fair point. But um, if I went to a concert, I would love to hear, like, for example, in Jaws, to hear uh, Man Against Beast, you know, something like that. Yeah. If, if you look at the soundtrack, you'll know what that is. You, know, but, you gotta, like, um, go to, like, a... Uh... You gotta go to like a recording, not a recording, but you gotta like go to a concert where they're like playing an yeah. entire album. Like I went to uh not not a score playing, but I went to like one of my favorite bands, The Offspring, and I went and uh I saw them for their anniversary, twenty year anniversary of their album. Um yeah, I saw well anyway, I saw its twentieth anniversary and they played the entire album. But they're not gonna play all those songs at a regular concert. A regular concert, they're gonna play no. the greatest hits, you know? That's makes sense. Well they started actually play in this recently where they'll show a movie. And they'll play the orchestra, will play the score on the stage. On stage. And that, they done Jaws in uh, England a few years ago. I think it was Manchester in London. But I wasn't going to travel over to watch, to watch it there. But if it ever came to Ireland, if it came to like Belfast or Dublin, I'd maybe even travel down to Dublin and watch it. But that, that would be an experience. So you watch the movie, and then it's a live orchestra playing the score. And I've seen they've done other movies. They've done the likes of, um, I don't know, movies they've done. I think they've done the right? Um, and they've done Jurassic Park and movies like that. Yeah, I'm sure that they def. I think I've seen them do ET actually, but that's that's one of that's yeah. my personal favorite John Williams score. But I just I love ET. That's just a child. Oh, it's an amazing score. Yeah, that's a that's a childhood favorite of mine. That's why I put ET at number yeah. one. Is just because like I grew up with ET. My mom showed me that at a really young age. I'm talking like three or four years old. So it's kind of been ingrained in my mind as uh yeah. that's the one for me. <laughs> Yeah, well, well um, I don't know if you heard of a label they call Nala Land, and then there's Entrada. Um, they actually do movie scores. They released ET a few years ago. I don't know if you can still get it. It's it's the see back in like the seventies and the eighties, they would release the soundtracks, but it would be a re-recording, so it wouldn't be the movie version, and it would be more like a more like an album that you could listen to, like you know, so it wasn't just all the views from the movie. The cues from the movie can be different. So this Entrada edition is the original album present, remastered, and then the actual movie version. And I think it may even have cues to get in here in the movie as well, or variations on cues and things like that. That's they awesome. do a lot of open stuff 
they've done Jaws, Jaws 2, they've done um, Jurassic Park, um, you know, they've done E.T. If you're a fan, see, see if you can get it. Like, I think I've seen it even on vinyl and stuff like that. I mean, if you're a fan of that score, it's right. outstanding. It's really, really nice to listen to. Yeah, one day when I, I get a little bit more money, I would like to start like listening to stuff on vinyl because I've heard that that's always the best way to listen to something is on vinyl. You're going to get the best. Like, it's like uncompressed yeah. in comparison to like obviously anything digitally is going to have the compressed audio. But right now it's the best yeah. I got. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. Something for the future. Yeah. Can right. I just ask you one more question? I might have just going out of it at 16%. Um, oh, absolutely. I just wanted to ask you as well what you thought of uh, Joe's 2 in the second half of the movie with the teenagers being more akin to a slasher movie. Yeah. Well, how did you feel about that? That is actually something I, I appreciated that. That's why I always felt like the sequel like is more of a horror film, especially in the third act. You know, you got the big ending where you kill the monster and then like they're just teenagers and they're not great actors, any of them. So it feels so much like what would eventually become 80s horror in a sense. It, it feels literally yeah. like a sequel to a Friday the 13th film or Freddy Krueger film. Just in yeah. that third act, though, not the whole movie, but just when you start concentrating on the teenagers because they're in parts of the movie but they're very spread out their scenes like yeah you get some conversations yeah. with him and his son Roy Schneider and his son but I always felt like his son the actor just uh, I was kind of missing it I don't know how you felt about that yeah I've heard a few people say that they weren't too um, happy with his acting I, I actually think if there was ever a case for nostalgia and I'm not talking about the whole movie I stand by around his head about the movie I love Jaws 2 I think it's the best sequel we could have got back in 1977 78 I love Williams' score. Roy Shader's performance is amazing. It's not perfect, but I do think I'm a bit blanket with the nostalgia where the teens are concerned because they don't bother me. I think I'm just so used to watching them over the years um, that they don't bother me. But I do think in a lot of ways that they're a lot more rounded and a lot better than some teens you see in slasher movies. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's definitely not like there's some bad slashers in the 80s, so it doesn't fall into that territory. You know, I still, I love, I'll defend that ending to Jaws too. I love that. That was why I was like, you know what? I'm glad they did that. I think that is so cool. <laughs> you know, the shark, the shark's all beaten up. He bites the wire. I'm like, you know yeah, what? That's yeah. a cool ending. And he's on fire. And I, I love, I love the way, like, in the first movie, like, the shark's raising towards Brody. So he's running out of bullets and he's shooting. And you can just see the, the top of the nose and the door's open and he's firing. Yeah. And then it explodes. But in the second one, like, the shark's croaked with him. Oh, he just gets you know, out of the way. Right, he yeah. Could have got electrocuted himself, yeah. yeah. But the whole thing is, when it bites the cable, and it's on fire, and and it's and it's being electrocuted, like you see, kind of Brody going like that, yeah. And and looking, and you can just see the massive jaws just right in front of him, like on fire, and just lingering there, and then just sinks under the water. I just think all that is brilliant, and it's different than the second. It's not the same. Okay, you have the same approach. It's heading towards him. All that to me is just what makes it a, a good movie. I completely understand. Like, I, I don't think it's a bad movie. Like, I didn't enjoy it as much as you, even on the rewatch. But the first one, I'll always watch it. I always will, and I'll always keep trying because I think it's definitely a good movie. You know, it's still one of Spielberg's best. It's just one of the best movies ever made. It's just not my uh, complete cup of tea. You know. But watch Jaws three and four, and you'll probably appreciate it just a wee bit more. Oh, I appreciate a lot of movies after I rewatch Jaws 3 and 4. But you know what? <laughs> At least Jaws 3, it's good for a laugh in a couple st scenes. It's like watching, a, you know, Friday the 13th Part 3. Like, just watching what they were trying to do with yeah. the 3D effects back then. It's fascinating. At yeah. least just from a, a standpoint of just as the viewer. <laughs> yeah, do you know what? As I say, I'm a fan of the old franchise. After I've watched these movies since I was like, um, I'm a teenager. I've watched them like every year since I can recognize the flaws of three and four, I understand them. I understand why people don't like them. Um, I, they're big get good pleasures for me. But for me, Jaws 3 is a real trashy movie that I enjoy it on again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. It's always Everyone has franchises that they love, and then there's movies in there like everyone else might think is shit, but then you go and watch them, and you're like, you know, I still like them. Like, uh, that's like kind of like yeah. me with the Terminator franchise. Like, other, even, yeah. other than Genesis, I'll still watch them all each year just because it's like, ah, I love the Terminator, you know? <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, but that's, fair enough. that's a fair point. Like, I, I can relate to that then, you know? Yeah, like everyone I think has that franchise where everyone else might be like, ah, I only like the original or the one or two. 
too. And then they're like, they're, there's the fans of the franchise who's like, well, I like them yeah. all. It's just like, they, for me, it's like getting in a time machine and going back and watching stuff that I get nostalgic for. Yeah, like Neighbor on Elm Street. Yeah, exactly. That's another series where I'll watch them all, no matter what. I, I, even five, and I have no idea what yeah. the hell is going on in Dream Child. <laughs> John, I actually think Nightmare on Elm Street 5 got on Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Well, you know what? I, I think I agree with you as far as an entertainment factor, but 4 has the scene in there. I love the time scene where they keep repeating the loop in 4. Yeah, yeah. That scene for me is uh, it's one of my favorite scenes in the whole franchise, and it just happens to be in the rest of the, my movie is forgettable. Yeah, that, that film's horrible to me. <laughs> uh, a lot of people think that 4 is one of the best, and I think that's why I'm so hard on it. Because people don't think five is one of the best. They think it's one of the worst. And I watch it and I go, it's okay. Yeah. It's, you know, it's entertaining enough. You know, I think it's a little bit more coherent than four. Because then, then I sit down and watch four that people think it's one of the best. And I go, this is absolutely Christ. This is, what is happening? This, what, what is going on? I would probably <laughs> so, actually put five at number. Yeah. I would still put five ahead of, uh, definitely ahead of two and four for me also. I think two and four oh, are the worst. Oh, really? Two is one of the worst? I think two is one of the worst. I rewatch two all the time too. That's another one of those movies because two's kind of gotten a resurgence where people start to appreciate it. Yeah. And I think two only gets good at the very at the pool party at the very end. I do love that scene though, the pool party scene. I love two. I've always loved two. Yeah. Like, really? For years. You know what I mean? Ever since I first really seen it, um, and I didn't realize till actually when the internet comes along, as I was saying earlier, that I just really hate it. But now it's kind of like the cool one today. It's like, oh yeah, I like. You know, everybody says, oh, who's not that bad now? So I don't know what that's about. Two came back around. Like, two, I remember, like, I was in the majority where people hated two, and now I'm kind of in the minority yeah. where I hate two. Whereas I like, I think one's the best, and then I think three's close. I really like Dream Warriors. Yeah, you know what? The long way it was like one, three, two, and then New Nightmare for me. I was in top four, but recent, recently, I don't know. It's neck and neck for me between two and three. So maybe even just go one, two, three, new nightmare. But I'm not sure. And then maybe five after that. Yeah, I like. I also like the final nightmare. I mean, it's terrible, but I actually get some enjoyment out yeah. of it. So like, it, I have fun with it because they've swung for the fan- fences, and I, I like to see Yafia Koto, whatever he pops up in. Oh, you're talking about Freddy's Dead. Freddy's Dead, the final nightmare. A movie's horrible, but there's <laughs> a lot of nostalgia about that one. I, I remember that's the one. Though, apart from the new nightmare, that is kind of the one. That, when I was a more Freddy Krueger in the late 80s, early 90s, that was like the new one. Do you know what I mean? So that was the one that you'd see in video tools now. So there was always this kind of mystique around it about, oh, maybe not actually Freddy Krueger. But see, watching it now, it's it, it's dreadful to see yeah. where Freddy went. He turned into a fledged movie turn. <laughs> oh, no, he's a cartoon character in that. That's actually, but that's why I like it. It's just, it, it's so different from the rest. It's literally just, I don't even know how you describe it. It's just a straightforward comedy. Oh, oh, it is. And he's playing it like that, too. He's playing it for laughs. He's playing it like Bugs Bunny. Oh, yeah. There, I mean, there's a freaking Nintendo Power Glove ad in that movie. <laughs> don't forget the Power Glove. Oh, my God. And then, obviously, you bring Johnny Depp back. and I think that even has Roseanne Barr and Tom Arnold in it. Oh, my God. But I don't know why. I'll watch that. I'll be enter- I sit there entertained. <laughs> Bond, do you know what it is? It's like it's like Alien Three. Yeah, like, I'll go through a phase where I'll be like, I'm gonna watch Nightmare on Street, whatever, and then I'll end up watching the series over like a lot of weeks. I get, I get that. the six, and I'll be like, I'm gonna, I get excited about it. I'm gonna watch Nightmare on Street Part Six. <laughs> it's gonna be bad on this game. I know it is. And you watch it, and you come away going, How did that even get me in? <laughs> That's how I feel about. I'm telling you, that's how I feel about the second one. I, I never understand how you go from one to two, and then like three is good again, and then. But the thing is, with all of them, I, I still like them. Like I'll, I'll watch the whole franchise. It doesn't really matter. The only one I absolutely just will never watch is the the remake. Oh, you know what? I actually have the remake here in DVD. I'm sorry. And, um, <laughs> I know, man. I don't even know when I moved house. So I was getting rid of a lot of DVDs. I shouldn't have that Charlie crap. <laughs> oh my god. But, <laughs> funny you should say it. I actually have the actually box set here. Um, I will watch all the originals. I'll even watch Freddy vs. Jason. Oh, I, I like Freddy vs. Jason a lot. Some... <laughs> yeah, Freddy vs. Jason's not bad, isn't that? No, I like that one. But but I, I talking about the Street Three. I understand how they got there with that one. I, I do understand how they they ended up with that movie. 
Yeah, I, I, I mean, I understand like a behind the scenes thing because that's yeah. the last time I would say that like Freddy's like absolutely scary and petrifying. Three is kind of mm-hmm. like where we start to get the turn, and then by the time we get to Freddy's dad, he's just a cartoon character. <laughs> he's a party of himself i guess yeah like three right. like three through five you know he's it, it's a mixture of horror and comedy one and two he's a straightforward horror character then by six he's just uh, uh he's a looney tune like you said and then he, they try and they pull it back again with a new nightmare yeah the new nightmare to me is kind of like because it's like i'm coming in the real world and heather lanning camp is heather lanning camp it, to me it's not part of the original franchise as such yeah, I don't count it as part of that either. I, I, I count it as its own entity as well. I actually count it more as like a yeah. prequel to Scream in a way because it's a meta horror movie two years before Wes Craven did Scream. Yes. Yes, it, it, 100%. That is the precursor to Scream. And seeing a lot of ways, it was ahead of its time. I, I actually think that um, a great back to back watch, a double feature, is New Nightmare and then Scream. I think that's a great double feature. I agree. A hundred percent agree. That is definitely because you can see the origins of Scream right there, right in front yeah, of you. And it's made by the same guy with S- if you know. Yeah. And he gets a cameo appearance in both of them. Except he plays a character. He plays himself in in uh in a new yeah. nightmare. And Scream he's a Freddy Krueger basically, he's the janitor of Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I was about the Oscar. Who is against Scream that dawned on me? He plays the janitor and he's wearing the jumper, the same jumper. And that, that- um, Robert Engels wore and David Ashley won. Yep. Like, that's a nice... And his name's Freddy. He's like, not you, Fred. <laughs> wasn't Fred. Yeah, he's like, not you, Fred. <laughs> yeah, Fred. Yeah. So speaking of horror, did you notice... Um, you, you've seen Christine, haven't you? Yeah, of course. Love Christine. John Carpenter. Yeah, did you did you notice that Keith Gordon was in Jaws 2? Ah, you're right. I didn't even realize... I was actually... I didn't even realize that, but you're 100% right. Yeah, I meant to mention that. I, yeah. I actually have a story about Keith Gordon very briefly. Um, so when the internet came around, mm-hmm. these kind of like Facebook posts popped up about Jaws and things like that, people started contacting the teenagers who are now grown adults. I got talking to one of the teenagers who was in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and asked for his autograph. And he sent me it. I says, I don't know how I come up with conversations because it's been back a few years now, John. I came up with Keith Gordon. Him and Keith Gordon are still very good friends. And he says, me, listen, Keith is hard to get hold of. He doesn't normally do things like this. He says, but I'll ask him, will he sign a photo for you? Oh, and I says, would you do that for me? And he says, yeah. So I sent him the photo. And a lot of weeks went by. It came in the post signed by Keith Gordon. And there was a note with it saying, I gave it. Uh, someone lines up, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm on location at the moment. I um, hope you like the same photograph. That's awesome. I, I do you know what? See when I took the picture. I didn't realize the note was in it. Huh. And I nearly threw it out. I actually, I actually kept blue the cardboard in and sent it in. It was sitting there one day, and, and a load of weeks went by, and I went to throw it out. And I just happened to look inside it and there was a note. There was a note as well. Oh, it was written like on like a little hotel type of like um, page story. You get those notepads and hotels. Yeah, on the hotel on it. Yeah. yeah, usually at the desk with a pen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, yeah, you know. That's awesome, though. That's actually really cool that he did that for you, especially since they said that like he never really does things like that. That's actually awesome, then. He must have caught him at the right time. Yeah, well, I think it's because like, uh, the, the, the guy I was speaking to, the old game who it was, he was in Jaws 2, uh, I was chatting away at him, and they you know, just keep, became friendly, you know what I mean? And then, and then it was just kind of like, I don't even know how to come up with it, people, to be honest with you. I think it was him saying that he's so good friends and things like that, yeah. I think I probably threw it out there, like, oh, we're making a photograph, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he was like, oh, I'll ask him for you. I'll, I'll get in contact with him because, he, he, like, some of the things that were in Jaws 3 that have, like, you know, Facebook pages, things like that, but he, he, he does not have any contacts because he's stayed in the business all these years. You know what I mean? He's been very successful. He's been, he was in Chris Payne, he was in Dress to Kill, and he's became a successful director. So um, he's still very much in shifted the more, but like kind of he's still in the Hollywood system pretty much. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That he did that for you though. I, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, I kind of like when I when I found the note, I, I kind of felt but uh, about it because I didn't get a chance to say to your mom because it was like weeks later. Oh, I, I got the note. Hell, thanks very much. I'm near then come back here. Get years, years. I got this. I, I'm. I'm near certain that he did actually, um, I did say thank you, like, you know what I mean? I would have said, oh, thanks for doing that for me. But um, because I didn't see the note, I kind of regret that scene, to be able to say, he wrote me a note as well, tell him 
thing. So it's almost like he done two things for me. Do you know what I mean? He, he does send the picture and done the note and then sample back. Yeah, like I, I get that. And then you don't want to go back and be like, oh, I didn't even notice because then you'll be like, uh, make you look like you're embarrassed. <laughs> Like, oh, yeah. I just found the note. It's been a couple weeks, but I just found it. Like, yeah. I, I get how that is. Do you know what? Like, I was like, thank God I didn't, thank God I didn't throw that out. That's what I was sitting thinking. Yeah, well, that that's definitely great because you that's it. Then it would be gone. You wouldn't even notice. All right, guys, thank you for joining us here on our breakdown of Jaws 1 and 2 and just our Jaws conversation. I hope you guys liked it. And if you did, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, make sure you like this on all podcast services, and we will be seeing you next time where we're going to be actually talking Batman. So bring me and David, one of our favorite movies of all time. <laughs> so uh, we'll see you guys around.